Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. Today I've got Crisis at Steamfall, which is just coming to Kickstarter. So I'm going to talk to you about the rules and the setup for Crisis at Steamfall, because I'm going to play it with my friends, and I want you to be able to follow along. Crisis at Steamfall is a action, building action selection adventure game where we all play characters from a steampunk universe who live in a city, the city of Steamfall, that's been impacted by an alien presence, which takes the form of these strange alien artifacts called pylons. The pylons affect the, cities in diff the city in different ways, and the game has two modes that reflect that. You can play in the competitive mode where you're all playing against one another to influence the citizens of Steamfall to gain the most renown in order to win the game. And you can also play a cooperative mode which takes place later in which the alien pylons have started to corrupt the citizens and turn them into evil mechanized zombies. You're going to have to work together to defend the remaining citizens and the city from these evil undead minions. I'll teach you how to play both different versions and I'll show you the characters and the components that come in this prototype set that I've got. This may vary from the final Kickstarter product, so I recommend if you're interested, you check out their campaign and see what else they've got going on. But otherwise, I hope that you'll enjoy coming on this adventure with me and my friends, and I will now teach you how to play Crisis at Steamfall. So here in the box I've got the city tiles, and these come in three different kinds of tiles. So here we'll look at those in a bit. But the, these will make up the board and the city that we wander around as we explore Steamfall. These are citizen tokens. You can see here that the token shows good citizens on one side and evil mechanized citizens on the reverse. You won't use the mechanized citizens in the competitive mode. I've got here some resources, steam and charges. Charges go on equipment and represent how many times you can use that piece of equipment before it's exhausted and needs to be recharged. And steam is a resource that you collect from the board and does many useful things such as charging equipment. Here I've got a bag of insight. Insight is another resource that comes in the game and this is used usually to pay for skills and abilities. It can be used to pay for pay for acquiring useful items as well. We've got scrap here. Scrap is another useful resource. This is sort of less valuable than steam, but also more useful in some ways as well. Scrap can be used to charge up items or it can be used to build things as well. Here we've got another bag of resources. Now these are general resources that are used in both versions of the game. These tokens here represent items that you can find and pick up. These tokens here represent renown. In the competitive version of the game, these are victory points. And in the cooperative version, they allow you to use special abilities. Then we've got here stamina tokens. These stamina tokens are basically wild cards and they can be spent to add one of any action type to your pool. Here I've got a general bag of uh, bits and pieces. This includes secret locations that are going to be placed around the map that represent places we can go in order to do various uh, special tasks and get special resources and things like that. The secret locations will be more or less important based on which of the asymmetric heroes you've taken on the role of playing. So here we have my generic bag of stuff. This is stuff that's used in both the competitive and the cooperative version of the game. We have here a deck of relics. Relics are really, really powerful items that represent sort of alien technology and allow us to do a bunch of cool and different things. Here we've got a deck of regular items as well. These are just sort of uh, standard items that the humans have made based on the alien technology and stuff like that. Less powerful than the relics, but also really cool and useful. We've also got here relic tokens. Relic tokens represent alien artifacts that we can find in the city and we can spend points to gain rewards and these can be used twice so they're flipped over to their just slightly destroyed side you can use them again and then they are discarded i've also got here a bunch of secret locations these are general secret locations this diamond symbol here means that this is used in both the this can be used in both the competitive and cooperative version of the game so you'll see all of these have the diamond symbol on them We've got here an action tracking card with a little bit of a reference on the back as to what all the different actions mean. I'll explain those in greater detail because it varies very slightly in the different versions of the game. 
But as your character gains actions and stuff like that, you'll probably need to track them, how many you've got left and of which type. So you can move cubes along here to do that. And this also functions, can function as a sort of active or first player marker, which is quite useful too. Here we've got citizens. These are various citizens that you might find around Steamfall. And they're all different types of character. Here's Explorer the dog. Explorer has a passive a bonus that he gives you when you take him. He's also got an action that you can do that lets you do more stuff. And a quest here that he wants you to complete, which you'll be rewarded for if you complete it. So this is my competitive bag. This has various components that I'll only use in the competitive version of the game. So let's have a look and see what's in here. You can tell whether a card is only used in the competitive version of the game because it's got this little symbol here. I don't know how clear you guys can see that, but it looks kind of like an S with a cross through it. But this is the symbol for the competitive version of the game, and this only appears on cards and items and icons and things that are used for the competitive version exclusively. This is a special event deck that's only used in the competitive version of the game. We've also got in here these cipher tokens. The cipher tokens correspond to these ciphers here, and these allow you to spend resources over the course of the game to unlock them for special bonuses. We've got more secret locations here. And here I've got some items that are also only used in the competitive version of the game. I've also got here a co-op bag and some Serenity tokens. This stuff is only used in the co-op version of the game. We have here the core shard. This will be given to the first player in cooperative mode and is required to turn off a lot of the badness that's happening in the city during this time. We've got a resonating artifact here. This it will be given to the second player and it allows you to explore ruins more easily. We've also got here a deck of cards that have multiple functions. These cards are used for defeating enemies when players attack the enemy creatures. It's used for defeating enemies. It's also used for enemies when they're attacking the players. These cards will be flipped over for that. And finally, it's also used for interacting with citizens as well. Some citizens won't automatically join you like in the competitive mode. In the cooperative mode, you have to flip over a card to find out what the citizen does, and it may or may not allow you to escort them. It also gives you a choice. We have here a crisis deck. Crises will be coming up every round and there'll be problems that we have to solve or else bad stuff will happen. They'll also tell us monsters that'll appear and stuff like that in the city. But this means that at the end of the round, bad stuff will happen unless we complete the task at the top. You'll notice that all of the co-op cards have the co-op symbol here, which is a sort of a gemstone, just like on the back of these crisis cards here. And this replaces the funny dollar, curly dollar symbol from the competitive mode. Finally, I've got four alien pylons here. We'll use more or less of these based on the number of players. Four for four players. And three for three players and so on. Finally, I've got a bag of serenity here. This resource is placed in the middle of the city in the co-op mode. It represents the peaceful nature of the citizens and it will decrease as bad stuff happens. If this ever reaches zero, i.e. you've expended all of your serenity, then the evil wins and you've lost the game. And then I've got player baggies. I've got Lucius, the Plague Doctor, Marcus the Steam Wizard, I've got Alice the Poison Gardener, and Jim and Beam, a monkey and a woman who like to snipe. These characters are actually all really cool because they're quite asymmetrical and the way in which they interact with the board and the different elements on the board is quite unique to each different class. Alice and Beam are sort of violent and intimidating and they sort of, in the competitive version of the game, they'll go around intimidating citizens into supporting their cause. In the cooperative version of the game, they're really good at killing the mechanized. They'll start with this special ability called Two Troublemakers which is a different version in competitive and cooperative as well. That's competitive there, and this is cooperative. Well, here in the competitive version, you've got intimidation tools and observation tools in order to help you gain secret, uh, citizen support and to see what uh, the citizens are up to. But in the cooperative version of the game, you've got this power fist, which allows you to kill enemies more easily and throw items around the board, which is really useful. You've also got this rifle, which is a rifle and a shotgun in one. It's pretty neat and it deals damage to enemies and allows you to snipe them anywhere on the board. So super efficient at killing the mechanized evil. So in addition to these starting items, we also have in here this player board, and I'll explain these boards are really crucial. You've got these action tokens here, which slot into the board to determine what actions you can take. I'll explain how that works in a bit. However, it's very cool, and 
all of these tokens are unique to each character. They'll have different ones. So the combinations of actions they can make will be different. So that's very cool. So that's all organized into there. We've also got here a mood counter and this will tick up and down based on whether you're in a bad mood or a good mood. Jim and Beam have pretty bad days and their good mood tends to be quite short. So we've got here influence cubes. These will be used for different things depending on which version of the game you're playing. This is the little tracker that tracks your mood. And here we've got the player token. This is going to represent where you are on the board and move around the board as you move your character. This is Marcus the Steam Wizard. You can see he's got a mood that's sort of opposite to that of Jim and Beam. And he, so he can get a much better mood more easily. He's also more charming and less violent than they are. Marcus specializes in play, in inventing things. And so he starts with a bunch of items that the other characters don't start with. He has about twice as many items, but these have to be installed in secret locations where he's sort of working on them in secret. And there is, you will see a competitive version of each item and a cooperative version of each item as well. So make sure they're the right way up, depending on which version of the game you're playing. Now these items will be doing different things, but what you'll be trying to do is install them in secret locations in order to have different effects and give you different bonuses. Again, you've got a completely unique set of these action tiles, which can be slotted into your board as you build out your character. More starting equipment. Again, these are double-sided. <clears throat> Two of these are a piece of equipment and one of these is an ability. This is the same for Jim and Beam. One ability. So the ability of Marcus is to have this steam friend here, who wanders around the board, helping him search for secret locations to install his inventions. And here's the token that represents that creature as it moves around the board. Here's the player token for Marcus the Steam Wizard as well. That's all the components with the exception of this variant bag, which offers some slight variants for the competitive mode mainly, but we won't worry about the variants for this particular video. So. The first thing I'm going to have to do is set up my city and the city will be set up the same way no matter which version of the game you're playing. It, the only difference will be how many players you're playing with. So we've got to pay special attention to these tiles with alien artifacts on them. These are your ancient tiles and form the corners of the board. This is the central square of Steamfall and this will always go in the center of the board. These are sort of general districts you'll find around Steamfall. So this is sort of the junkyard district, and this is actually specially specific to the prototype. This is because it's got to have multiple functions depending on whether or not it wants to be a regular district or an ancient district. But in the final product of the game, you'll have actually 10 tiles, which will include an extra ancient district and an extra city district. But for the purposes of this prototype, this one is both. So if I were setting up a two-player game, I would put down my central square here in the middle. Now the orientation is random. Then I'll add a city district here. And I'll add another city district here. Bearing in mind that the orientation is important because these arrows are used to determine movement costs. Another city district here. Then I'll add an ancient district to each corner like that. Now my two player board is complete. If I'm going to play with three players, I'll add another ancient district up here, as well as another city district here. And if I'm playing with four players, I would add another ancient district to the bottom corner here, in this case, using my prototype tile. So what I'll do here is I'll start off by setting up a three player board for the competitive game. However, I will let you know when it stops playing, being applicable to the cooperative game because a lot of this will be transferable. So I'll take away my prototype tile because I'm setting up a three player game here. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my secret locations. Now I have to put out my secret locations. I'll use all of the generic secret locations that can be used for either mode. I'll find the secret locations for the appropriate mode, which could be from the cooperative or competitive deck. So here's my competitive bag. So I'll take out my competitive secret locations here. But if this was the cooperative version, we'd be using the cooperative locations. What's important to note is that there is a character, Marcus the Steam Wizard, who has a secret lab. Now there is a competitive and a cooperative version of the secret lab, but no matter which version you're playing, you must make sure you find the secret lab and shuffle it into the secret locations deck. This is part of the asymmetrical gameplay that you get with the characters, which is really neat as the different characters use different 
elements of the board and of the game to complete their sort of different roles, their asymmetric play styles. So I've got my secret lab there. So in this particular version, I'm gonna need 12 secret locations, one for each of the movement spaces attached to the outside of the board. So I make sure my secret lab is in there. I then shuffle the remaining secret locations. Again, this is a competitive version that I'm setting up here, but you would do the exact same for the cooperative version. So I need 12, so I'll deal another 11 cards into this pile. Then I'll discard the any leftovers. I'll shuffle this new deck to make sure that the secret lab is well hidden inside. And then I'll assign each secret location to one edge of the board. So now that that's set up, I'm gonna add some resources to these tiles that we can collect when we explore them. They start with items and they start with insight on them. Workshop items are added to locations that are attached to city districts, so not the ancient districts in the four corners. And then I'm going to add insight to each secret location as well, which we get by visiting the secret locations with sort of like clues that we uncover. Each city gets one insight and each Secret location attached to an ancient district gains two insight. So now that that's done, I can encourage my players to pick their characters and set those up. I'm only gonna set up one character board for the purpose of this video, but of course, if you were playing with three players, you would set up three character boards, and when those were set up, you'd put your characters here in the center of the city. So here I've got out all of Marcus's stuff, now, I've set up Marcus because I think he has the most unique setup of the characters. However, I would point out that all of the characters, even though they're asymmetric and a bit different, are mostly self-explanatory, so I don't really need to go through all of the different equipment that they have and how it works. You should be able to understand it if you understand the rules of the game. We all start with some equipment here. The, these are more equipment items down here. Now, these items and these items, although the cards are different sizes, are basically the same kind of thing. What's interesting is here, this is our starting action area. Now we've got these action tiles down here. There should be enough to completely fill up our player board by the end of the game, but we'll start with a preset number on the board. So here in the rule book, you can see the preset starting setup for Marcus, and he starts with three boots and a star in the leftmost column, and a good behavior and a manipulate action in the middle column as well or the second to the right. Down here you can see Alice's starting setup. We can also see here Lucius's starting setup as well. Then it also has some special setup for the competitive mode as well. So make a note of that if you're gonna use Lucas, Lucius in the competitive mode. Lucius kind of uses this stuff called the substance. That's kind of his thing. It's like a sort of, I guess it's like a drug. It manipulates his mood and can have a different effect based on what he needs when he uses it. And in the co cooperative mode, he can go into the relic deck and find it using his starting items. And in the competitive mode, he has to go through the relic piles to find the substance. I guess it's like an alien substance that he needs to find. And once he gets it, he can use it to manipulate his mood and give him bonuses. And we've got here Jim and Beam's set up as well. So here I've got Marcus's starting player board set up with the two action columns set up as well and his mood starting in the middle here. I've also got charges on his starting items here. I'll go into items in a bit more detail a bit later on, but every item has a sort of a full capacity for charge, which is here. And the filled green squares are the starting charge, but you can charge it up to three. You can add a charge by spending a steam, but a bit more on that when we get to the rules of the game. But at setup, we'll put one charge for every green symbol on the charge barometer here. So now that Marcus's player board is set up, I can put him in the center here along with his steam elemental. So I'll need to get my resources and my citizen tokens out as well. In the competitive version, I won't be using the mechanized, so I don't need to worry about that but they're all the same icon anyway, and I will need the citizens for this version of the game. I'll need to get my insight tokens out. Insight is important no matter which version of the game you're playing. My scrap. And finally, my steam and charge tokens as well. No matter which character you're playing, you'll start with the same starting resources, a stamina, four scrap, and a steam. The first player is determined randomly and remains static throughout the course of the game, so you won't ever change who the first player is. Now, if I was setting up the cooperative version, I would put out some Serenity, but 
I'll continue with setup for the competitive version and I'll come back and talk about the cooperative setup later. So now I'm going to do some stuff that's unique to the competitive mode of the game and once I've gone through the rules of the game I'll come back and explain the cooperative setup as well. It's not really that different, there isn't a whole lot of different stuff you need to do and a lot of the actions and stuff remain the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one of these cipher tokens in each of the ancient districts. These just have victory points on the back, so if you unlock the cipher, you'll gain bonus victory points. These are only used in the competitive version of the game. These are the cipher cards. These represent the cost of resources you will have to pay in order to unlock the ciphers and gain the victory points underneath. We see here, this one requires green, two greens and a red in order to unlock it. The price of these actions is down here, and if we do happen to unlock it, we gain three renown tokens. This is the competitive event deck, and I'll just shuffle this and put it near the board. And now we're actually set up and ready to play the competitive mode of the game. No matter whether you're playing competitively or cooperatively, Crisis at Steamfall is played over three rounds. Each round is divided up into three actions. So when we take an action as a character, we select one of the columns on our player board, which gives us a number of actions to spend. Those actions can then be spent to gain more actions, to play items, to gain more actions. The way the game kind of works is that we snowball these actions into more and more efficient combinations, allowing us to accomplish different tasks on the board, which will give us more items, which will give us more actions, essentially trying to have the longest and most productive turn. So at the beginning of the first of the three rounds, what we'll do is we'll check for this Pac-Man symbol here, which represents something that we need to do at the beginning of a round. And this will happen at the beginning of each of the three rounds. For example, we can see here on this city district that this is the city action here. And this is stuff that happens at the beginning of the round. We know that because this symbol means at the beginning of a round. Now we place a citizen and we draw a brown event card. Note that this brown event card is unique to the competitive mode of the game, so if we're playing cooperatively, we would only place a citizen and not draw an event card because we wouldn't have this deck. This is an action that you can take in the district when you move in, and I'll explain that a bit later. This ancient district here has the same thing, except that you'll notice this blue card with the cooperative symbol on it. This is used in the cooperative deck and not doesn't come into play in the competitive mode. So in the competitive mode, we'll just look at these two symbols here. So we just looked at this city tile here, and that has a symbol of a citizen on it. So I'll put a citizen token down in this district. It also has an event symbol on it. So I'll draw an event card and enact what it says on this event card for this district. So this event card here says the city unveils. And so what this means is that this card will go down here in the district. We'll add a ruins if there isn't already a ruins in the district. This is the symbol for ruins. Which are these here? So I will take a random ruins token and put it down here in the district as well. That's something we can do there now. It also says reveal one adjacent secret location without influence. I'll explain a bit more on how that works later, but this symbol here means that once this is done, this card will be discarded. Otherwise it will remain there until someone uses it or the game ends. We'll still draw another card at the beginning of round two. Now this district here just has a steam token, so I'll put down a steam here, and it has a ruins token, so I'll put down a ruins as well. I'm skipping over the cooperative card because we're not playing cooperative, we're playing competitive. Over here, I've got the same deal here with a citizen and a crisis card. So this crisis card has us adding another citizen. It's also got an ability on it that we can use. More on that when I get to the player action round. So over here, we've got another steam and a ruins as well. Here I've got a citizen and another event card. It's another city unveils card. How about that? I'm going to use all my ruins. Over here, we've got steam, ruins, and a workshop, which allows us to pick up an item. And finally here, a citizen and another event card. Uh-oh, civilian zombification. It's already starting the precursor to the cooperative mode. So now that I've done that, am I'm ready for my turn to begin. At any point on my turn, I must add one of my action tokens here to my player grid. Now, I want to think very carefully about this, especially at the start of the game, because I don't really have a lot of equipment. Equipment is a great way to unlock further actions that your character can do on their turn later on, so you can have more productive turns. Equipment really turns like a, 
a sort of a very short go into a very long and productive go. So equipment is really very important. If I'm not taking a column that's already full, then it's almost always in my interest to add a token first, especially if I'm putting it in a column I might pick. If I wait and do it later, then I might miss the opportunity to have that action on my turn. So let's say I'm gonna pick this column here. I will add a token to it first, and now I'll have three actions instead of just two. However, this is my first turn, so I'm gonna pick this column here, which gives me movement, because I probably wanna move around and do some stuff. It also gives me a star. A star is a sort of a special action that can be used to typically to use your special ability, but it will have slightly different applications based on which character you are and based on whether you're playing the cooperative or competitive mode. So just make sure you check out where that is on your character. For example, with Marcus, it allows me to move my steam elemental, which is kind of unique to Marcus and his setup. So I think the best thing to do now is take a look at these different actions and what they mean. The actions are pretty much identical in the cooperative and competitive version of the game, but there's a slight difference when it comes to the violence action. So I'll explain that when I get to that one. As discussed, we have here the star, which is the special action. This typically links in with your character's abilities or card. For example, Marcus's steam or para shade here is steam elemental. We can see here in the competitive mode, the star or a steam resource allows you to move the shade. There's a bunch of little iconography in this game. It's pretty self-explanatory. If the icon doesn't appear in this list here, then it's probably a resource rather than an action. For example, this steam symbol here is a resource. The next action is movement, and this allows you to move around the board. So let's have a look at the board and see how that works. Here we have Marcus in the center of the board here. He can move through any of these joined crescent red symbols here, and when you move through these, you count up the number of diamond shapes within them. This is the cost to move. For example, moving through this corridor here would just cost one movement because there's one diamond symbol. Over here, we see a much more expensive movement. It would cost three to move through this corridor here. The secret locations are slightly different. We've got a half-colored diamond here on this card. What that means is that it costs two to move in because this side is shaded, but only one to move out because the side on the bottom is unshaded. You can continue to move around the map as much as you want, as freely as you like, until you've exhausted all of your movement. If you later acquire more movement in the turn, you can move around. It's up to you how many points you want to spend to continue to move around the board. You might sometimes find as well different actions that appear in unique scenarios, for example, on an event card that comes up or something like that, where you can spend movement to do a thing, in which case you just need to amalgamate movement points on your character and spend them to accomplish that task. But Traditionally, movement is used to move between the different districts and the secret locations. The next action is manipulate. Manipulate is this grabby hand. The manipulate action allows you to pick up items on the board and accomplish certain tasks as well. Most commonly, it's used for picking up items. For every manipulate action you have, you can grab an item from the table. For example, Marcus could use movement to enter this district here and then use a manipulate action to pick up this steam resource. If Marcus were to enter this secret location here, then the location would be flipped over. Now there are two resources in this location, Insight and a workshop icon. Insight is automatically gained. This sort of represents you discovering clues around the city. So whenever you enter a location with Insight, you'll automatically pick it up. The items, however, must be picked up using the manipulate action. When you enter a secret location, you can look at the card and you may choose to reveal it or you may choose to leave it face down. If you choose to leave it face down, you simply exist there until you decide to move out. You can also pick up this item using your manipulate action if you want to. If you flip the card, then you put the resources listed here down onto the card so the card would have a steam on it. You can also then use this action here to manipulate actions to place a influence on any location card. When you enter a secret location, you can put your influence on it. So long as you have an influence on a secret location, then you can use the ability on that secret location from anywhere on the board, which is pretty cool. Any number of players can have influence on a secret location. Just because you've got yours down there doesn't mean that it's unique to you. So if I leave this here, You'll see it now costs just one movement to get in and out of the secret location. If I use the manipulate action to pick up this workshop icon, I return it to the supply like this, and then I draw a item from the item deck 
like this. Now this item is added to my hand. In this case, Marcus's hand is his three starting items plus this one. This is a secret. In a cooperative game, I can share without worry of reprisal, but in a competitive game, I might want to keep it a secret. After we're done looking at actions, we'll look at items in more detail because you'll need actions to play them from your hand. We can also see over here in this city district a relic. The relic has three manipulate action symbols here, a colon, and then two, two relic symbols. These are relic symbols which represent these cards, item cards. These are sort of alien artifacts that are typically found within relics, but can be gained through other means as well. If Marcus were in this district, he could spend three manipulate actions in order to activate this relic here. Now this is still on its first side, which is indicated by this U-turn here. So if I were to do this action, I would have to spend three manipulates, then I would gain two relics and flip this to its other side. Now you can see we've got the same thing, but it's slightly more difficult, and the U-turn has changed to a cross, which means this is discarded. So if this action were taken by a player, this would be discarded after it was resolved. If I gain relics, I just add them to my hand like any other item. There is no maximum hand size as far as I'm aware. That might change down the line. But these items can be played to the table from your hand for an additional effect, which allow you to do more things, or you can hang on to them in case you need them for other purposes. So the next action we'll look at is engineering. The engineering is a bit of a specialist action that's used for activating areas on the board. It's also typically used for playing cards from your hand and using those cards as well. Look a bit more at how items work and how they're crafted later on. But items will exist in your hand like I discussed earlier and you'll have to spend actions to play them from your hand. A common action you'll have to take to play them from your hand is the engineering action. The action that you use appears here in the top corner of the card. So if I have this auto sword in my hand and I want to play it to the table, I'll have to spend one engineering action in order to do so. When it's played to the table, I simply put it face up in front of me and I add a number of charges equal to the green symbols in the total charge area here. Engineering can also be used for events such as this one here that came out earlier, the gate malfunction. Now in order to complete this event, I need to spend two engineering actions Six scrap, if you remember scrap, it's this resource that we gain. We can pick this up from the board. We can destroy items to gain more of it in the central square. And there are various other ways to get scrap as well. But if I have six scrap, I can spend that in two engineering actions in order to gain a renown. And then according to that red X, this card is discarded. However, the malfunctioning gate is currently sitting here on the board until such time as someone goes to complete it. The next action we'll look at is charm. Charm is a top hat that looks like this. And charm is essentially used for schmoozing citizens within the city. That's these people here, if you remember. In the competitive version of the game, you can spend two charm to draw a citizen card, which looks like this. And if you want, you can add them to your entourage. You can have a maximum of two characters in your entourage at any given time, and they have a passive ability, an action that you can do, and a quest as well at the bottom that you can fulfill. For example, here you can see action, disturbing secrets. That's the flavor text, the name of the action. In this case, you can spend an insight, and then you can gain either a good mood or a bad mood, and inspect a secret location card. So you can use that action as many times as you like on your turn, so long as you have insight. His quest is, complete the quest of another civilian. So if you complete another civilian's quest while he's in your entourage, then you'll complete his quest as well. And when you complete a quest in the competitive mode, you gain the rewards here, which is a renown and three insight. This symbol here stands for serenity and is only used in the cooperative version of the game. The next action we're gonna look at is violence. Violence in the competitive version of the game is exactly the same as charm, except you're not being charming, you're being intimidating. And it's the same deal, so you spend two violence in order to draw one of these civilian cards and then decide whether or not you want to add them to your entourage, same as charm. But I'll talk about how violence works in the cooperative version of the game when I get to that section after the competitive version here. The next action we'll look at is this stamina action here. When you take a stamina action, you simply gain a shield like this, and this shield can become any one of these other actions. Two quite unique actions you might also see are the 
good mood and bad mood symbols. Now these aren't technically actions, you can't take them exactly, but you might gain them a bit like a resource. To understand these, we'll have to visit our player board here. We start with a counter here which tracks our mood. As we gain good, good mood, we'll tick up the top towards the uh, blue line here, and as we gain bad mood, we'll tick down the bottom towards the bad mood symbol here. If you gain good mood while you have bad mood, you'll tick back, and if you gain good mood while you're on zero space here, you'll tick up. At any point on your turn, you can decide to spend all of your mood to gain actions and resources equal to the symbols here. So for example, if I'm in the penultimate slot on the good mood track here, and I decide to activate my mood, I move the token back down here to the bottom, and I will gain four charm. If I'm on the top, I'll gain six charm and a steam resource as well. Similarly, if I'm on the bad mood and I decide to reset, then I'll gain two violence and an engineering as well. You cannot use stamina to gain good mood or bad mood. You can only use it to gain the actions that you might get as a result of that, such as violence, charm, or engineering. There's no limit to the number of times you can spend your mood on your turn, provided you want to spend it and it will get you benefits. So you can spend your mood any number of times to increase your action pool and continue to do things on the board. So actions are the primary way in which we interact with the world of Steamfall. They allow us to move around the board. They allow us to interact with the ruins. Once you learn the iconography of this game, you'll pretty much understand how it works. And often you'll find that as you spend actions to do things, these will unlock further opportunities for you, which is the very nature of the game. Items are an incredibly important way of enabling you to do more stuff on your turn, enabling you to be more efficient and get more out of the game. So let's now have a look at items and how they work. So the game features a bit of a crafting system. There are three kinds of equipment cards or items in the game. You've got base item, mo power module, and add-on. These three items can be combined in different combinations to give you different kinds of custom items that'll help you do what you want to do. You can gain regular workshop items, and you can also gain alien artifact items. Now these are special items that are sort of more powered by the artifacts, whereas these are more sort of based in the world that we exist in. However, you can combine power modules from this set with this set, you can combine add-ons and base items from either set in any combination you want, provided that they have slots for them. Slots, what do I mean by that? Well, let's have a look at a base item first. Here we have F off Cannon 6000. Now, this is a workshop weapon, so it's a brown card, and you can see in the top corner here, would play an engineering to play this from our hand to the table. Now, there are several things you should be paying attention to on this item card when you are considering playing it. You're looking at these symbols here. These symbols mean that it, you can equip a power module to this card. And this symbol here means you can equip an add-on to it. Some items won't have these symbols, which means they cannot have these items equipped to them. An example might be this key. You can find this key in the game, and you can see here that it's got a dash, which means that you don't actually have to spend any actions to play this from your hand. You can play it immediately. Then at the bottom it says, trash, move to an adjacent secret location without spending movement. So essentially what this is doing is allowing you to make a more economical move into a secret location, but it's a one-use only item, hence trash, so you get rid of it. But it cannot be modified or enhanced because it's not really that kind of item. Whereas this, this can be. So when we play this from our hand, we get three charges on it as per the power bar here. So we'll put down three charges because we just played it from our hand. At any point on our turn, anytime we like, we can take another engineering action. We can spend that action to gain a charge on this item. So there are our three starting charges. So what does the F off cannon actually do? Well, it says here I can spend three charges to gain two violence actions. And then it says you must move to an adjacent and revealed connected area. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm firing this gun, which is a mag mega gun, and it blasts me into an adjacent area. And then I gain two violence actions, which I can spend to either murder mechanized people or intimidate civilians. Here's an example of a power module. Now this is also a workshop item, and you can tell it's a power module because it's got the two symbols here on this side of the card. It also says workshop item power module here on the card, in case that wasn't clear. Now we're spending another engineering action here to play this, and it comes with one charge icon on it. It also has a total of two possible charges on it. It also has a special ability at the bottom that says trash, gain a steam. But the main thing we're looking at here is steam for charge. So if I play this onto my F off Cannon 6000, it's now a steam powered F off Cannon 6000, which is pretty dang cool. And what this means is that I gain, first off, I gain an additional charge. That's from the one charge that comes on the steam powered. Now the total charges of this item is six instead of 
four because these are combined. Additionally, what this means is I can now spend steam to charge this item. This is one thing, not two. So it can be charged with either engineering actions or steam resources. So that gives me more options if I want to restore charge tokens to it. So I can attach an add-on to this item as well, but this doesn't change the very nature of the uh, F-off cannon here. It still does the same thing. It just gives me options for charging it. So now I've picked up this relic, which is an add-on. It's of insight. And I attach a magnifying glass to my item and it makes the item do other things. It says trigger and then shows the insight symbol. So I play an engineering to play this from my hand as normal. And what this means is that whenever I trigger the item it's attached to, I also gain an insight. So I can attach that down here like this. And you can see these link up. And now whenever I use the F off Canon 6000 to gain violence and move to an adjacent area, and it's, that's not optional, I must move because the, can, the violence of the cannon, but I will also gain one of these insight tokens and add it to my player board. So this makes it a more efficient thing to use. Now there are loads of loads of cool different items you can make and you can search through the item decks looking for different things to use and as you discover them, you can play them from your hand and these will give you more and more opportunities to do different things. You could play the F off cannon on a turn that you picked it up and then immediately spend all of your charges to gain two violence to then go and do something else and move to a different district as well. So the items really are powerful in enabling you to continue to do things on your turn and maximize your opportunities to affect the board. So now that you understand how actions work and how items work, you should have a pretty good idea about how this game goes. You're moving around the board, you're interacting with different things. For example, these cipher tokens, they allow you to spend actions and resources in order to flip them over and gain renown that way. Another way to get renown is to complete civilian quests. There are plenty of opportunities to gain renown. One of the things we should look at are all the actions available on the board. So these are district actions here, and district actions have different effects, but they're pretty much the same kind of symbolism as the rest of the game. Once you get your head around this colon symbolism, you can pretty much interpret how everything in the game works. For example, in the central district, if you're located here, you can spend four scrap to draw three workshop items and keep one of them because they have the red discard cross on two of these three cards. Down here, you can see that if you spend either a workshop item or a relic, you can gain either two scrap or one insight and three scrap. Note that this is one workshop item is destroyed for two scrap or one relic is destroyed for an insight and three scrap. Slightly more unique is the action here on this district. This says whenever you enter this district, gain a bad mood. Whenever you spend movement in this district, gain a bad mood as well. So this district just puts you into a bad mood. So after I've placed, after I've chosen an action column, Play will pass to the next player who will pick an action column and do their entire turn. And then the play will pass on to the next player who will do the same and back to the first player who will do the same. We've got three of these cubes here. And once we've spent all three cubes in our columns, you'll note that two of the columns can be picked twice and two of the columns can only be picked once but these columns have slightly more space in. You see, as we're building out our board, we cannot extend below the bottom of the board. So you have more options to fit more actions into these columns here, but you can only take them once per round. So in each round, you'll add three icons to your player board here because you'll have three turns per round. After those three turns are exhausted, which you can tell by the three cubes placed on the top of the board here, then you can move on to the new round. And at the end of the round, what you're looking for is the inverted Pac-Man symbol. The inverted Pac-Man symbol looks like this down here. What that means is that anything with that symbol triggers at the end of the round. So for example, this area here says, spend four violence and discard a civilian token from the current area, gain a renown. So essentially what we're doing is we're finding civilians have already become, begun to become mechanized zombies and we're murdering them for renown. Pretty grim but we can do this as many times as we like, provided there's still civilians and we have the violence actions available. And then at the end of the round, this will go away and be discarded from the game. So after the third full round of gameplay, that is the ninth turn that you will have because three rounds, three turns per round. At the end of the ninth turn of the last player, the game will end and you'll total the number of renown points you have. You'll add any ciphers that you've managed to pick up You'll also check to see if you have any locations 
or anything else that triggers at the end of the game. Some might say at the end of the game, gain a renown, or this is worth something if you have an influence here, for example. So you count any of that up as well and see who is the winner. The person with the most renown will win the competitive game. If there's a draw, then the tiebreaker is insight. And if there's still a draw, then you're instructed to duel each other with nerf guns. So now that we've looked at the competitive game, let's have a look at the cooperative game. The cooperative game functions fundamentally very similarly to the competitive game, but we'll get rid of some of these components and we'll look a bit at how it changes. So I'll take out the ciphers. These aren't used in the, these aren't used in the cooperative game. I'll reset the board because I haven't started deploying things yet. I can also get rid of these events. The events aren't used in the cooperative game either. They're replaced by a deck of crises cards, which is this blue deck right here. So in the cooperative version, I've also got this encounters deck, which I showed you briefly earlier. This has behaviors on it for the mechanized, for damage that we do when attacking the mechanized, and also for when the mechanized attack us, and also for civilians as well, their behavior too. So I'll need that deck here. So my setup is basically the same. I'll set the board up in the same configuration. I can randomize the orientation and placement of the tiles for the, for the new game, but the number of tiles and their positions remains the same. So ancient tiles in the corner, for example. What I'm gonna do differently this time is put a pylon on each of these ancient tiles. In order to win the game, we have to destroy these three ancient pylons and not run out of in serenity in the center of the board. So I'm also gonna put eight serenity tokens in the center of the board here. Now there's a maximum of 10 serenity in the game, so we can't ever get more than 10 serenity here in the center of the board. We start with eight, and if we ever run out of serenity, we lose this version of the game. Now we're all working collaboratively to try and destroy these pylons, which we will destroy using an item called the core shard, which is given to the player, the first player who starts the game. So the core shard is an item, it can't be upgraded, it doesn't come with any charges, and it can hold a maximum of four. It costs three insight to add one charge, and you can spend all four charges to destroy a pylon in your area. Then each character who's playing in the game can add a charge to one of their items, and if all pylons are destroyed, you can flip this card to the overloaded shard, which helps you to kill some mechanized if there's any left on the board. So this will go to the first player, but you can trade the item back and forth. You can use a manipulate action to give the item the core shard to another player, or you can use a manipulate action to take it from another player. And when it travels between players, it keeps its, sh its charges. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the start of the round for the cooperative version of the game. It remains very similar, except these districts here, they'll just get a citizen. I'll just simply ignore the crisis card entry. This district here is gonna gain esteem just like last time. It will gain a ruins just like last time, but it is going to have a crisis card. So let's have a look at a crisis card. So here's an example of a crisis card. This is dangerous leak. It says, the top here is the task we need to accomplish in order to resolve the card. Down here is the bad stuff that happens if we don't resolve the card. And down here are some things that are added to the district, regardless of whether we resolve the card or not. So we'll start down here and we can see that it says to add two steam and two mechanized zombies to this area. So I add two of these steam tokens into the area. And then I add two mechanized zombie citizens as well who are zombie citizens that we're going to have to deal with in order to resolve this issue, I think. Now, if the round ends and we haven't gotten rid of this, then we'll have to take three chaos. Chaos is anti-serenity. Whenever you gain a chaos, you lose a serenity. So we'd have to remove three of these cubes. Now we only start with eight, so that's over a third of our starting serenity. So that's really bad. We want to try to resolve this if we can. Once we've done this, if we fail to resolve the crisis before the end of the round, we will discard this card, so it won't persist. But we'll get a new one at the beginning of the next round anyway, so this can escalate pretty quickly. Now, in order to resolve this card, we have to clear all the steam from the area and spend three engineering actions. So someone's gonna have to pick up all this steam or some use some other method to get rid of it, and then we're gonna have to spend three engineering actions, in which case the player who did that will gain a renown and discard this card. 
So I'll leave the card here in the district to show that that's still in effect. Now you'll notice that you gained a Renown for that. This isn't a competitive game. So what is Renown good for? Renown allows you to activate abilities and do certain things that you couldn't otherwise do. So Renown still has uses, but it's no longer victory points. It's instead a resource that activates items and actions. Over here, I'm just putting down a citizen. Again, here I've got a Steam, a Ruin, and another Crisis card. So there's gonna be one Crisis card per district. Let's have a look at this one. So this crisis card here is the Centurion. Now you'll see the layout is very similar to the crisis card we just looked at, but there's a few key differences. For a start, this is one mechanical zombie plus two scrap. What does that mean? Well, that means he's like a super dude. So each of these zombies, and we'll look at combat in a bit more detail a bit later, but each of these zombies does two damage, has two actions and two hit points. So what this means is that we can enhance them with scrap, and for every scrap used to enhance them, they gain one action and one hit point. So in this case, this dude has two enhancements. So we put down two scrap like that and put him on top to show that he's super elite. And now he has four actions and four hit points. So he's just much harder to kill and he's a lot more damaging if he's allowed to go his own way. So in order to resolve this crisis, we'll need five violence actions. So we'll have to come here and spend five violence. If that wasn't enough, we also have to hold the core shard. This means that we have to have the core shard in our possession in order to complete the crisis. We don't have to use any charges or anything, we just have to hold it. And if we fail to do that, then we'll gain a chaos, which means we lose a serenity, and we'll have to move each mechanized villain by one space. So that's really bad. So now I put out another citizen in this district here, and then I go over here and I add a steam, add a ruin, we get a workshop token here as well and another crisis. So we've got a vibrating ruin, which adds another ruin. Now, if you're ever instructed to add a ruin and there's already a ruin in the district, ignore it. Even if that ruin is destroyed, don't fix it, just ignore it. Now I'm adding another mechanized zombie man here and two more scrap and one elite zombie as well. So that's a zombie with one scrap. He's not a super elite like our Centurion dude over here, but he's still tougher than your average zombie. And then finally over here, a citizen. And there we are, we're set up for the first round of the cooperative game. Oh, actually, I have to add my player token to the center of the board. So these mechanized guys here who exist on the board, at the end of the round, so that is after the three turns, after each player's had three turns, at the end of the round, these guys are gonna move around and do very bad things. So we want to try and kill them before that happens. How do we kill them? Well, we spend violence. So in this version of the game, violence is no longer used for intimidating citizens. You can only charm the citizens if you want to interact with them. Violence is instead used for attacking the mechanized citizens. And it's the same kind of deal. You spend two violence and then you get to draw an encounter card. So this function on this card is denoted by this up here. And you can see down here, we've got the charm a citizen because Charming Citizens works a bit differently in this version of the game. I'll talk about that in a minute. But up here, we've got one mechanized symbol and two violence because that's what happens. So this is got some flavor text on it. It says Clockwork Menace and then shows two damage. So this allows me to do two damage. There's also a tech keyword here. If any of my items have the keyword tech on them, for example, my channeler's staff here says tech, then I will activate this passive bonus and gain a charge on my tech item. That's energy surge. That's pretty cool. So when I pay for this card with my two violence actions, I simply put it down next to the district in which I activated the ability and the card remains in effect in this district. Now I can continue to add encounter cards to this district using violence and then activate those cards at any time I choose. So for example, if I've drawn this card, I can see I've done two damage against this guy. We know who needs four damage, two standard plus two more for these scrap tokens because he's a super elite. So I'll have to get some more encounter cards here searching for more damage. Fortunately here, I've got two more damage and I can now kill this piece and I'll just remove him from the board and these encounter cards as well because I've resolved them. This doesn't end my turn or anything. I can keep going as long as I want, adding encounter cards to districts, provided I've got the actions to pay for them. 
If Marcus wanted to interact with a citizen here, it's very much the same. I'll just flip over one of these encounter cards, but instead I'll look at the bottom here. So this says, startled cosplayers, discard this civilian and gain a funky cog. Well, this funky cog is the cooperative symbol for serenity. So I'll get one of those white serenity cubes and add it to the central district. So we've got one more life before we lose the game. Super useful. It also says gain an insight and then install an item from your hand for free. So this citizen has helped me to do things, but hasn't actually joined me as an escort. In the cooperative version, players automatically join your entourage. I can still only have two citizens in my entourage in the cooperative version, but they also don't automatically join my entourage. It only, only if it says escort this citizen, which this does not. You'll also notice that there's a passive bonus down here for the keyword elegance. It says Fix their hair. You fix the startled cosplayer's hair, and then you can escort them instead of doing this business up here, and you also gain an item from the item deck. Very handy. So once I've resolved this card, I take this token and remove it from the board. So a crucial part of the cooperative game is gaining insight in order to charge up the core shard. That's very key. So that's sort of what I'll be looking to do as I move around the board. I'll be looking to leverage these secret locations because they all contain insight that I can pick up automatically. Finding relics is also really useful because I can bring them back to the central area here and destroy them and gain an insight that way. But there are lots of other ways to gain insight, including from items and doing various other things as well. So at the end of the round, before I get to resolving these crisis cards, if I haven't resolved any of the crisis, this is probably going to be a very short game. But before I resolve the crisis cards, I have to resolve the mechanized. Now, the mechanized have a series of priorities that determine their behavior. Their first priority is, is to attack players. Their second priority is to attack civilians. Their third priority is to move. And their final priority is to attack the central square. Now, they have a number of actions equal to their health. So the standard guy has two health and two actions. This guy here, because he's got a scrap under him, has three health, therefore three actions. And my super dude, who I seem to have put away because I guess I killed him, has four health and therefore four actions. The first thing the mechanized will do is attack a player. So you can often put yourself in the same space as them to prevent them from doing anything worse. However, they will only attack you once. So for example, if I were in this district here, then these they would each hit Marcus once and then they would have one action left each because they've got two each and they would move towards the central square. Now, because they've got two equal positions here. We can choose which district they move into. They both moved into here and that's two actions because they hit him each once and then they each moved into here and that's two. Now when they hit a player, you draw one of these cards and apply the middle effect here. So these two mechanized each hit Marcus. The first card shows minus one charge. Ignore this effect if you have armor. So if I have an item with the armor keyword, I can ignore this effect, but I don't. So I lose a charge. I just pick one of my items and remove a charge from it. Now I'm being hit twice because there's two of them. So the second one, I also lose another charge. And this one passes through armor if I had any. So I'll remove another charge from one of my items. And then these monsters here will each move into this district and they've been resolved. Now let's look at our mechanized super warrior here. He's not in a district with a player, so he'll ignore that part of his priority chain. Now note that um, these guys still only hit me once, so they don't sit there wailing on me until they're out of actions. This is the only one of the four priority steps that is once per, that is only resolved once. So over here, there is no player to hit, so our super mech will move here. He will then attack this citizen. When he attacks a citizen, the citizen is murdered and we lose a serenity. Now he's still got two actions because he moved and attacked the citizen. So there's no citizens there. So he goes back to move. He'll move in here. That's action number three. And now he's got one action left. He's in the central district. There's no players, there's no citizens. So he'll remove a serenity. And that's pretty much it. We'll resolve all of the mechanized guys. So again, here we've got this guy moving into this district. He kills a citizen, which removes a serenity. And now if we're smart, we'll move this guy into this district as well. And then he'll move in here. <clears throat> now this guy is going to move into this district. We could send him this way around, but it'll actually have the same effect. So we'll go one, two, three, because he has three hit points. So that's not a good round. And now I'm going to activate these crises. The steam, the dangerous leak alone costs me three serenity, which 
means I lose the game. However, this is just an example that I'm playing by myself, so <clears throat> hopefully when my friends come and join me to play, this will be a little easier, but we'll see. Once you've resolved the crises step, that is go around these crisis cards and resolve the red text on any that remain on the board, or resolve the red box on any that remain on the board, then those cards are discarded if they have the little red X, and most of them do, then you're ready to go back to the beginning of the next round. Now the cooperative game ends the same in the same way as the competitive game. After each player has had nine turns, that is three rounds divided into three turns each, you're still building up your player boards in exactly the same way, spending your actions in the same way. Like I said, the only real difference with actions is the violence, which is used for murdering these guys instead of intimidating citizens. And at the end of that round, you will have had to defeat these three pylons, and if you've done that, and there's still Serenity in the middle, then you've won the game. Note that you don't have to kill all the mechanized, but it certainly helps because they will have a turn before the round ends, and if you haven't kept them under control, they'll move into the central district and remove all your Serenity, and even though you've destroyed all three pylons, there'll be no Serenity left and you'll lose the game. So, you've got to try and manage them and destroy these three pylons with the core shard. You've also got this resonating artifact, which just helps you activate the ruins to help you get relics, which will help you get insight, which will help you charge the core shard. So that's kind of how this combo works. But there are other ways to get insight as well, including exploring all the secret locations, which is very useful. So that's it for Crisis at Steamfall. I hope this video has made you excited to play now that you know the rules and you know how to play. I hope it's intrigued you. Maybe you want to go and back the game on their Kickstarter page, so there'll be links somewhere for that. Unless the Kickstarter's over, maybe there'll be a link to their website or something. Who knows? But we'll be back tomorrow, and I'll be sitting down with Chris Britton and Ben Hirsch, and we'll be playing through the cooperative version of the game to see if we can survive the mechanized onslaught and destroy the alien pylons. So I hope you'll come back and join us for that. Thanks very much for watching.